Hi, I want to take a few minutes and I want to talk about what I found in Standing Rock just to help you get started on your analysis that you can use when you're doing rhetorical analysis, which you're doing a rhetorical analysis essay. The first thing I wanna say is rhetorical analysis. Well, any analysis of a text is about asking key questions. The questions change depending on the kind of analysis you're doing. And, and right now I'm focusing on rhetorical analysis, which means you know, like understanding what's the argument? How does the author build the argument? How does the author make the construction of that argument persuasive for the primary audience? And then you know, like who's the primary audience and so forth. And so let's get started. If we were meeting synchronously, I would be asking you, what stood out to you and why? Now you might think that that has nothing to do with rhetorical analysis. And yet I would say it really, really does because as a reader who's reading a text, it's important for you to get a feel for the text. And if something stood out to you, it resonated with you, it made you think, it made you imagine something, it made you feel something, chances are it's going to do that for the primary audience too. And so you want to pause there and you want to think, what, what is the author doing here? What's the rhetorical strategy? Why is it making me feel disturbed or sad or curious or disgusted? I mean, or intrigued. I, and like, why is it doing that? And you want to think, you know, like, okay, would it have that same impact on the primary audience? Is there a little difference there? And so these points, these first impressions are really, really valuable to you in identifying rhetorical strategies that actually have an impact on the audience. And those are the rhetorical strategies you want to choose when you are writing an essay like this. Don't choose strategies like tone or language because those are so vague. Those aren't places in the text where the author is doing something extraordinary that makes you go, oh. Um, the other thing that you never want to dismiss when you're doing a rhetorical analysis, you might not write about it, but it will help you with your analysis is the title. This has a pretty standard title, um, what I found in Standing Rock. So it should prompt you to think, um, what did he find in Standing Rock? And because the answer to that is going to help you, um, because the titles titles hint at what's to come, and, and obviously he did find something, and that something matters. Otherwise, Koenig wouldn't have titled this that way. Um, the other thing is, what is Standing Rock? And um, I hope you look that up if you are not familiar with it. This uh, Standing Rock is an Indian reservation. Um, in the Dakotas, North and South Dakota. It's the Lakota tribe. And um, it's been in the news lately because of Standing Rock protests because they are building the Dakota pipeline through this reservation, really close to it or through it, I, I don't remember which. And it's also close to their water supply, which threatens, I mean, like that was the explanation in the text, but uh, this is really, really important. So, so in 2016, that is when, um, April, 2016 is when the protests began. And in October, 2016, um, soldiers came through and they started mowing down the camps um, spraying water at the people, and it got really, really violent. Um, and so he is, this is published in December, 2016. And um, so, so that's the context in there. And at that time, um, this was very much in the news. And so it's very important to think about the title as well as what's going on at that time. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about narratives in this text, but I do want to say that narratives are really valuable for building claims because they speak to things that are otherwise unspeakable. So whenever you see a narrative in a text, you want to think, why is that narrative there? Is it building a claim? So the narrative prompts people to draw conclusions 
And those are claims, perhaps implicit unspoken claims in a text. You also wanna think about you know, like what function do they serve? Harriet McBride Johnson, this quote is really powerful because when somebody tells a story, it allows us to get inside their head to experience what they experienced in a new way. So for example, when um, Koenig talks about um, where he's doing the basketball camp at Standing Rock and people ask him questions and they ask, did you have a lot of um, Native American role models and it stops him in his tracks, we get inside his head and we see, you know, like what it's like maybe to never have any role models that look like us, which is his story, something I never experienced, but I can get inside his experience through the power of storytelling. So anytime you see a narrative in here and he's got lots of them, tell that story. Now, um, think about what that story is doing, what that is functioning. You should always make an attempt to know a little bit about the author. And I know some of you chose this text because you knew that Bronson Koenig was a basketball player, still a basketball player. He uses his identity pretty powerfully to build the argument and to construct ethos. Not just his identity as a basketball player, although that's very valuable, in the publication where this is, the Players' Tribune, um, but he uses his identity as a, an indigenous person to demonstrate his experience as an, as an indigenous person. Um, it shows he's knowledgeable in ways that the audience might not be knowledgeable. The fact that he's a basketball player makes him seem very normal. Uh, I'm not sure that's the phrasing that I want to use, but it makes him approachable to that audience of sports fans. It makes them start to trust him. Um, and so think about how he's showing his experience, his knowledgeability in multiple ways, um, how he seems fair, unbalanced. Um, even the research he does about tribes and about um, the history of indigenous people, the history of the Lakotas, the history of broken treaties. Um, all of that helps him seem very knowledgeable. I mean, he's there for a basketball camp. It makes him a good guy. Um, think about how he's using his stories and his unique identity to build ethos and to build his argument talked about where this was published, Players' Tribune, super important. Who reads this? Sports fans. Um, people who like sports, people who want to know more about players because players are the only people who publish, who write the texts in here. Um, we talked about relevant things happening in the world at this time. Um, all of that's important in understanding the argument. We're also thinking about when we think of audience, not just the demographics, but the author's underlying assumptions. These are beliefs, values, things the author takes for granted about relevant topics. And you want to look in this text deeply in order to do that work. Um, Whenever you're analyzing a text, you're looking, you want to look at how the author starts a text. Just like the Kelly Linfor text, Bronson Koenig begins his text by creating a setting. Um, he talks about seeing the Standing Rock camp for the very first time. And he has extended discussion of what he sees, how it makes him feel. It's almost like we're walking through the camp with him. <coughs> this is a multi-sensory description. It's what he sees, what he feels, what he smells, how it makes him remember things. Um, and he starts weaving in what he knows about the water supply, um, all of that's really important. Why? Um, 
because he's assuming his audience has not seen this, that they don't know this. And he needs to create that common ground so that they can travel with him through the story so they can see what he sees. Um, be thinking about what the overall argument is. Um, he's hinting at it at the beginning and he really creates a call to action at the end and which ties all the pieces together. The argument is the main point. It can be stated in a sentence and it does have a so what. It isn't just they should protect the water supply. It's something a little bit more than that. Um, I would be thinking about uh, ethos, pathos, and logos, you know, like the strategies that the author uses to establish that. How is he demonstrating he's trustworthy? How is he evoking emotions? How is he demonstrating his argument is reasonable? He's got all of those in here. Think about which are most predominant and why. And then, of course, that call to action at the end, wrapping it up. I will be reading your annotations. I'll be commenting on those annotations. Each of you need 10. They are due by Saturday. And then um, anytime between now and then, you can start creating that slide deck that you'll be posting. Work with each other. Talk to each other. I know it's tough asynchronously. So start talking. Thank you. That's all I've got.